I work on adding pages to my thesis, I thought I'd talk about SDS page electrophoresis. Um, so I've talked before about SDS page, and so in the um, beginning part of the video, I'm going to repost the video from before where I go over some of the theory, and then I'm gonna give you a practical look at how we set it up and run it um, and that sort of thing. I know a lot about what this looks like because I've run, since I started counting, 738 SDS page gels um, through my PhD process. And that's only since I started counting um, in order to keep track of them better. So I number them and then I like number them in my notes so I can just like reference back and forth between like the pictures and that sort of thing. But I know that a lot of people don't know what SES page actually looks like um, all the and that it's one of the techniques that is most important in biochemistry and that you'll probably do if you take some sort of biochemistry lab. Um, so I wanted to give people a sense of what it actually looks like practically. One of the first experiments you'll probably do in any biochemistry class is called SDS page, which is a technique that we use to separate proteins um, in a small sample based on their size. Well, actually it's their length, as we'll talk about later. SDS page stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So yeah, we call it SDS page for short. But it's important to know what these various components of the name stand for because that helps you understand how the process works. So sodium dodecyl sulfate, SDS, is a detergent, which is basically an artificial soap. It has a negative charge, um, and it has like um, this long hydrophobic or um, water excluded carbon hydrocarbon tail, and then this hydrophilic water loving head that has this negative charge. Um, and it hangs out in its salt form with a sodium ion um, to kind of like counterbalance that charge. But then when you um, dissolve it, it dissociates. So you get the sodium dodecyl, uh, so you get the dodecyl sulfate ion and then the sodium ion. So basically, once that's in the solution, it's a negatively charged thing. You don't need to worry about the sodium. polyacrylamide chains. So there's long chains of acrylamide and then they get cross-linked together to form this mesh. And based on the amount of cross-linking that you use, you can get tighter meshes, which are really good for separating smaller things, or you could get bigger meshes, which are great for separating bigger things. Then the gel electrophoresis part. This is how we actually get the proteins to move through the gel. So we establish this electric gradient where you have a positive charge at the bottom and a negative charge at the top. And we're gonna use this SDS to make all the proteins negatively charged so that they'll want to move away from the negative charge that you start them at towards the positive charge. So we'll have to go through the gel to do that. And based on how long they are, they will travel at different speeds because the longer ones are gonna get tangled up more. And thus travel more slowly you're not going to be able to see them as they go through. You're only going to be able to see a tracking dye, which d travels at the same speed regardless. It's not attached to your protein or anything. So then afterwards, what you're going to do is you're going to stain it, your gel, with um, usually with something like Comassi Brilliant Blue, um, CBB, and there are a bunch of different um, formulations of that. We'll get into that at the end of the um, talk. So let's take a closer look. So in this gel, as we said, we have this mesh, this polyacrylamide mesh, um, and we're gonna send the proteins traveling through it. But you have these, if you just take a normal mix of proteins in a solution, like maybe you did some sort of um, cellular lysate, so you broke open cells and you wanna see what's inside them or you're purifying a protein, so you have a partially pure sample, but it has most of the protein that you want and then some other contaminating proteins. And you wanna see how pure it is. So you wanna see what different proteins are in there, um, or at least what size of proteins are in there and how um, many different bands you see and that sort of thing. Problem is these proteins have shapes. That's kind of how they work is that you have these long chains of amino acids, but then they fold up um, into these structures that are actually functional. So the amino acids are like the protein letters and they have 
this generic um, backbone part that lets them connect to each other and then they have unique side chains or R groups that stick off and they have different properties and so those properties are going to influence how the protein folds because the amino acids with um, some of the prop the side chains some of them are small so they can move anywhere but some of them are big and bulky and they can't twist in the same ways some of them are positively charged so they want to hang out with the negatively charged ones some of them are hydrophilic so they're wanting to hang out with the water but the hydrophobic ones the water doesn't want to hang out with them so they have to cluster together in the center of the protein so basically the amino acids are the protein folds in a way that accommodates all of those different um, things so you get this beautifully shaped protein that's super functional and then if you were to try to send those traveling through the gel it wouldn't work so well because these proteins the shape would get in the way of them traveling um, at a consistent rate that you can compare between the proteins because some of the proteins are going to be sm like compact and some of them are going to be more loosey-goosey and so they're going to travel differently so what you want to do if you want to separate them by their length is you need to actually unfold the proteins or what we call this denaturing. So we're going to denature the proteins um, before we put them in. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's look at what happens when we put them in. So the longer the gel is going to act, um, it's going to act kind of I like to think of it as if you have a sea of basketball hoops, like basketball rim hoops and you put jump ropes, you throw, um, toss jump ropes down through them. The longer ones are gonna get tangled up more, so they're gonna travel more slowly. So what happens is when you stop the moving, so we're gonna be motivating them through the gel based on the charge. So when we turn off the charge, they're gonna get stuck where they were. The bigger ones are gonna be on top, um, higher up because they will have, won't have traveled this far. The smaller ones are going to be lower down. Um, but first we have to actually get them to move through the gel. And so this is where the charge is going to come in. Um, so if you think about it, some, some amino acids are charged um, positively, some are charged negatively, most are neutral. Um, so if you, any protein you have, it's not going to just want to like swim directly through the gel. It'll diffuse around a little, so it'll just like randomly move, but it's not going to have enough motivation to actually like untangle itself from the gel and move directionally straight from the top where you put it into the bottom. So it's not going to be very useful. So what you have to do is add charge. So this is where the um, electrophoresis part comes in. Um, so we use a, like a power box to set up this charge gradient where we have a negative charge at the um, top and a positive charge at the bottom. And so if you have a negative charged protein, all's great. It's going to want to swim through. But what if you have a positive charged protein? It's not going to want to go through. And most proteins are like this. So you see, like some parts are charged, some parts are negatively charged. So you get this overall charge, but proteins have all sorts of different overall charges. And... So if you have the charge interfering with how they move, then you're not going to be able to compare what you see. Kind of like how if you had shape interfering with how they moved, you're not going to be able to compare the different bands um, to get information about how long the proteins are. So we need to kind of uniformly um, uniformize everything. Um, so how we do this is actually really cool. It's with that SDS, so that detergent molecule I was telling you about. So it has two cool properties. One is that it's negatively charged, and the other is that it has this long hydrophobic tail. So basically, when you unfold a protein, it's not going to be very happy with you because it folded that way for a reason. It likes to, um, especially the hydrophobic parts, so the parts that the water doesn't want to hang out with. So basically, water, it forms these really exclusive cliques, and so it'll kind of gang up on the protein and cinch around the um, hydrophobic parts um, and so those will get clustered together towards the core of the protein. If you unfold the protein then all those hydrophobic parts are going to be exposed to the water and they're not going to like that. So they might just like clump up or aggregate and that's not going to be very useful because it'll just get stuck in the top of the like the well of the gel. So what you need to do is you need to unfold them and keep them soluble. Um, and so the SVS does this because those long hydrophobic parts can kind of like glob onto those hydrophobic parts of the protein. But then the SVS also has that positive hydrophilic head. So it's going to keep the protein soluble 
well it's unfolded and heat is going to help us um because the protein it has all these layers of structure and so the main the overall structure you see so what you could have um is normally tertiary structure so quaternary structure is if you have like a protein with multiple subunits um but all proteins have a tertiary structure which comes from secondary structure which involves the folding of the backbone and then all of that comes from the primary structure which is the amino acid sequence we talked about um and so heat is going to help denature that and then the sds is going to code it um yeah and then yeah so then the sds is going to keep it unfolded and give them that negative charge that they need to send them through the gel okay now that we got that theory underway let's take a look at what it looks like and how we set it up um and some tips and tricks and things to avoid um things to watch out for um how to interpret things that sort of thing okay so in our lab we make our own gels um or and we, well our tech we have lab technicians who will make them for us too which is really great um so i used to make like all my own but it took forever now we have like two lab techs so um they make stocks of gels for us and then keep them like wrapped in um wet paper towels and then coated with saran wrap to keep things tight um, so this is a eight percent page so this is a actually like we these are new page gels um this is gel system we also have like tris tricene um and so it's 1.5 millimeter that's the thickness and then 15 wells so there's some benefits to making your own gels and one of them is that you can like choose the thickness um and the number of wells so we have like a whole bunch of comb options so we um so we have like 0.75 thickness and then 1.5 thickness and that's determined by the glass and then you can choose the number of cones um so for like setting it up, you have this glass so you can see like this one's 0.75 and this one's 1.5. Um, and then they have the, the short glass piece that goes on front and then you put them in these casters and then pour the gel in between in that slot um, and then let it like jellify and polymerize and get all hardened. Then you can Maybe a protein serum. So those are like the caster things up top. Um, and they have this little clamps, but I don't know where they are right now. Oh. I have a post, I don't have a video on it, but I have a post on like how you set these up. Um, okay, but we're not gonna talk about that now. Um, so you can also buy like precast ones. Um, so the precast ones usually come in like plastic, um, plastic like back and front and you actually like crack them open to open them so there's little arrows on the side. Um, so it comes with like a tool is you can just do something like this um, just to like crack it open. But with these, uh, you don't wanna break the plates, um, but you do have to like peel them apart carefully when you're taking the gel out. Um, but let's, right now we don't wanna take the gel out, we want to leave it in because we're going to set up our gel. Um, so first we need to prepare our proteins and so I found these samples in my freezer um, from a protein purification that I did. Who knows one because I didn't label these very well because it was just one of those things where it was just like using that it that same day. So if it's something that I want to keep for a long time, then I'll label it better with like the date and everything. Um, so I've already prepared these samples. Um, so what that entails is I have this, I use this like 4X um, SDS page loading buffer I make and store it in this nice little uh, rack I've made on my shelf so it's always handy um, so it's 4x and normally what I do is I make like 24 microliters so I do like 18 microliters of my protein sample and then like six microliters of this um, and then I load like 10 microliters but that's just because that's normally what the like the protein concentration range when I'm doing a purification if my protein is really concentrated then I'll like dilute it first or I'll in or I'll load less um and so typically I like to load like I think about a microgram of protein if I'm like calculating a lot of times you don't calculate I just kind of know based on past purifications and that sort of thing how much to expect um, but if you like overload the gel, you're just gonna like get a smear or you're gonna get like this giant blob and then it's gonna warp, warp, blah, blah, warp like everything else in the gel. And so there's, it's kind of tricky when you're doing it based on like, um, like migs of protein or in this case, we're talking micrograms. So that's like a thousandth of a milligram um, or a millionth of a gram. Um, but so it's like, is it, 
if you're just like overall protein, then it's like can be a ton of different proteins. If it's like a beginning step of a purification, say, um, you have like a ton of proteins. If it's like the end, then you have like a single protein. And so you, if you have a ton of proteins, you can take a higher amount, load a higher amount of protein because all of the individual bands will be less. Um, but if it's like a single protein, then you have like a ton of it, then it's just going to like warp your whole gel and then you're just going to get this thing. Um, but of course, if you load too little, then you're not going to be able to see like all the contaminating bands and that sort of thing. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that for like a Western blot, you don't need to load as much because the antibodies are going to amplify the signal. Um, with this though, we're just like staining, we're just staining the gel with, um, like a Kamasi based stain. Um, so it's just like an all protein stain. Um, it's just going to stain the proteins. And so if there's not very much, you're not going to see things. Um, and so you might get the, you might not see a protein or that you are looking for, or you might, um, like, or that you, a band, what you think is the protein you should be looking for, or you, um, you like think your protein's a lot purer than it actually is because you only see a little faint band for your protein and you're like yay it's there but then there's a bunch of other proteins that this dye is just not sensitive enough to pick up um and so when we load the samples we have these nifty difty gel loading tips i was so excited when i found discovered these well i mean like i didn't really discover them like our i just when we had these in the lab like i didn't have these in undergrad but they have these long tips and so they actually like reach down into the wells. And so you can pipette into the bottom of the well and not have it just like shoot back up or like not try to do it from the top and then have it um, problem. It's a lot even more useful for um, like when you're running urea page gels. So like for RNA separation, because there you don't have like the stacking gel that you have with SDS page. So that stacking gel that we talked about where it has like the bigger holes. And so it like everything kind of gets to the start start line at the same time um which is where the like the resolving gel starts um you don't have that with a urea page so like where wherever you pipette it in is where it's going to start and so if you don't get all the way to the bottom of the well then it's going to mess up but also don't puncture the bottom of the well um okay so we have the so that 4x buffer so we i just like make a ton like a bunch of it and then like aliquot it so make like one mil portions in different tubes and then I keep it in the freezer um but it basically has like sds so it has the detergent it has like a reducing agent it has the dye um if you are really worried about like reducing agents so the reducing agent in here is going to so that's what um keeps things um, in a reduced environment so that like the cysteine cysteines don't form like cross links and so if you had like a cross link dimer um it would like um break it up um and so if you like the reducing um agent it will like go bad over time it would just like come not effective so if you're worried about that sort of thing you'll want to add reducing agent fresh before you run um so you can add like bme um, so yeah, but the main thing is that it has like that dye in it, um, and the SDS, so the detergent, um, which is going to keep the proteins unfolded and slippery. Um, but in order to get the detergent to coat the proteins, we need to also give them some help from heat. So after I, um, mix the dye and the protein, give them a quick spin in the little like pulse centrifuge, and now I'm going to stick them on this heat bath. Um, so we have this like sand bath. Um, so I think it's at like 95 degrees. Um, normally just give it a couple minutes and it um, should be good. Um, and so this is going to help unfold the proteins and go let the detergent coat them all. A thing to keep in mind is that if you have um, potassium chloride in your buffer, it is probably going to form this like precipitate. So you want to like pipette it fresh like as soon as it's out it's gonna be like most soluble when it's hottest so you want to like just take it straight out of the bath and load it um so sodium potassium um sodium dodecyl sulfate so sds um so that's soluble but potassium dodecyl sulfate so the potassium if potassium um teams up with that detergent that's not soluble so that's gonna like 
get make it precipitate and so you might be like trying to pipette it in and you see all this like clumpy stuff um, so don't freak out that's probably the um, the KCL in your buffer and so that's a problem with some of my buffers that I've um, had to deal with um, and then the other thing we're gonna want is a ladder so a ladder um, is just like a molecular weight standards so we use this like Biorad precision plus and so it, this is like yeah so you have this ladder that has like all these like proteins of known size that you can compare to um and so this is an unstained ladder so it's not going to um show up until we um until we stain the gel so like the dye in here and the dye in the loading um buffer those are both um those are both just like tracking dyes so they're not actually binding to the protein they're just like traveling along like the front of the um the liquid flowing through the gel so it's kind of just like showing you the where the liquid is so it's like the the thing that goes in front of the racer is whatever like that would be um so you're gonna have to actually stay in the gel in order to see the ladder and see your other proteins but that's gonna um having the ladder there is really important in order to show you like this um general size range where your protein fits in um like it should be around where it should be like in relation to the lines but don't worry if it's not exactly because different proteins will travel differently um especially because we're talking about like length instead of like globby size and that sort of thing. Um, so some proteins will travel a little differently than you might expect. It can also be altered by things like phosphorylation or glycosylation. So uh, modifications of like phosphate groups or sugar chains and that sort of thing can um, slow it down. Um, there's various weird things. And so sometimes proteins just run a little funny and we never really know why. But anyway, okay, um, so what we're gonna do is this is really hard to do things one-handed I'm gonna like try to set this set you down okay so we take the gel and so it's really important that if you make your own gel so you keep them like wrap keep them moist um, so when you buy them pre-made they normally come in like a little packet with some liquid um, and so with us we just like um, put, wrap them in wet paper towels um, and so you can see I hit, you have those gel plates where the gel was poured in and polymerized then you have this so this is a 15 uh, well gel you can see that that line there so that's where the so you have the stacking gel on top which has those big holes to get everything um, let everything like travel at the same speed till it gets to this resolving gel so that down here you have um, a tighter mesh for the proteins to actually get separated um, and so resolve so you separate them so that you can resolve the individual ones and tell them apart basically um, so you pull the comb out like vertically as you can um, some people think it helps to like do it while it's in the liquid but I have better coordination when it's out of the liquid um, so now you can see there's like wells where I'm gonna put the protein in um, so now I'm gonna stick it in this running gasket thing whatever you call this thing um, so these have this is a bio red like tetra cell thing so this is like our buffer chamber or this is gonna go into this has like the electrodes um, so that's where like the energy like the electricity is going to go and it's gonna like the electrons come in and then it's gonna like split water and stuff and so um, that's, so that's where the bubbles that we're gonna see come from it's like this electrolysis reaction um, so you have the splitting of water and it generates um, hydrogen and oxygen gases um, and so you see bubbles um, and so the bubbles is a sign that it's working so you always want to look for the bubbles and then get really happy when the bubbles form okay so this have these like you can tap it so that you have two gels running um, and so if you don't if you only have a single gel then you can put in like a buffer dam um, and so this buffer dam is like a fake gel um, and so it says like there was one side that has like this thing so if you look here it's this like rubber gasket it has this notch and these notches are really important because whatever you put whether it's the gel or the um, dam you want to stick it so that it like is right up against that or it's gonna leak so normally I, I stick it in like the bottom first and then I look and I push it right up to the edge 
and make sure it's not like overlapping the edge um, and it's just like right up to the edge. So right tight with it. And then I hold that on while I latch this, except I'm gonna, first I need to add my gel to the other side. So but I'm gonna do the same thing where I'm going to put it down to the bottom and then flat and then push it up to the edge and then clamp it. So that's really important with these because they have a tendency to leak if you don't like set it up right. Um, you'll see that the buffer level, so we're gonna fill the buffer like up all the way to the top, but you'll see the buffer level, if it starts to go down, then it can't um, like do that water splitting very well and the it'll slow down or it might even give you an error message. So keep an eye for you don't want it to leak. If it does leak, you can actually like add more buffer during the run, um, but you don't wanna have to deal with that. Um, so now the important thing is to put it in the box, right? So thankfully they have it colored nicely, um, but that is not foolproof. Um, even for like people with PhDs um, I've seen in the lab or people um, like me who are trying to get a PhD. Um, but so yeah, so you wanna make sure that red goes to red and black goes to black. And so there's like two slots in the front and the back. Um, so there's some units where, so this, oh, sorry. Okay, so this lid, the lids we use most of the time, they actually have, they're set up so that they just have for two, but um, there's, oh, or I guess no, these can work with both, but they have, we have different, so this one, so you can see, this is if you want to run like four, these don't have the sticky things on top. Um, so that's where you want to do it for. But if you only have two, you want to make sure that you have the sticky things that are going to go in the holes. Um, and so right now, so you need to put it in the slot in the box that'll let you put the cap on the right way. So you have red to red, black to black. Okay. So let's set up our gel now. So we make our own buffer too. So we have like two buffers for this system. So we have like a high molecular weight buffer and a low molecular weight buffer. Um, and we also have like a different buffer for, for, for the Trist glycine gels. Um, but so I normally start by filling the buffer dam. So that part that we just made. And to make sure, I do this first to make sure that it doesn't leak. And then if it looks okay, so then I just keep pouring. And so you wanna make sure that you cover the bottom, but you don't need to like fill it all the way up or that sort of thing. Um, so now that we have the gel set up, we can actually load it. Um, and so the bad thing about those gel loading tips is that they only work with certain pipettes. So this one works. Um, okay, I don't know if I can do this sort of thing one-handed. Um, can't even open the gel box. The things I do for Psycom, right? Okay. Lather, so I'm just gonna like load 10 microliters. I don't know if I can do this very well on camera. I'm nervous. But so it can be kind of hard to see the well sometimes, but you kind of get um, good at it over time. Um, and some of the pre made precast ones actually have like guides on them, um, like lines on them. My biggest problem right now is just doing it from the back. Okay. So if all goes well, what if the, I don't know if these samples are still good or if they got degraded, but they're from a purification, so we should be able to see the samples. Like things get less, um, fewer bands over time because each protein will have its own band, and then um, that'll show up. Um, Yeah, it's a lot easier to load from the front than from this awkward angle, but you get the point. Okay, so now I am going to stick on the lid. And this is not the lid that was attached to the box. This one was attached to the box. Okay. So now I set this up and I'm going to come and I'm going to turn on this power box. 
I'm going to start out at like 150 volts. So the voltage and stuff is going to depend on the gel uh, type you're using and that sort of thing. So look to a guide and don't just go with what I say. Um, but we'll start with 150. Okay. I'm going to press start, but I want you to look at the box, not at the start thing. Because something cool is going to happen. Well, it should. Okay, let's press run. Bubbles! Can you see the bubbles? I don't know if I have the camera right. Yay! Okay, bubbles. So bubbles, remember that bubbles are telling us that that electrolysis is working. And so you're having that water splitting, which means that there's like electrons flowing through things, which is going to create that charge gradient. Um, so that our now negatively charged proteins, thanks to the SDS, are going to travel through to the bottom, which is now positively charged, thanks to that electrolysis stuff. Um, and so you can see that the um, where we put in our sample, so the dye, it's kind of starting to migrate um, to that stacking line or the resolving gel line. Um, and so it's all going to get kind of clumped up there and then it's going to travel, start traveling through. Um, and so now it's going to run for like 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm not just going to like sit here and watch it. Um, and I'm not going to make you sit here and watch it. Um, so I will stop the video and restart it once the gel's done. Okay, our gel should be done now. Um, so the, you can see the dye line is almost to the bottom. Normally I let it go all the way out, but people are going to be actually coming into the lab soon. Um, and so I'm going to stop it now. Um, so I just, I'm going to turn off the power box. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the gel out. And actually what I need to do is get a gel staining box. Okay, so I'm going to get a gel staining box. So like some of these are just like sandwich containers. Some are the tops and bottoms of old tip boxes. Um, my favorite ones are like these um, like square ones that are actually, I think they're made for this. So they probably charge you way more. Um, okay, so now I'm going to take the gel out. And I don't know how best to do this and take this. So what I'm actually going to do is first I'm going to get some stain. This is like an instant blue stain. So we've been trying out a bunch of different ones. So the one we used to get got discontinued, but it works so much better. But anyway, it's like an instant stain. It's based on Comassi, which is like the classical. So the classical. This super dark thing right and it um stains really nicely but it also you have to like de-stain it and you have to fix it and stuff it's so that's kind of pain. so the instant stains are really nice because you can see things it has less like background and that sort of thing and you can like reuse it a bunch of times so like in the I'll actually, since this is just a demo, I'll just use one of these um, past ones because I don't really care. Okay, so yeah, you can just like, after you use it, you just like pour it back in here and reuse them like tons and tons of times. Um, but so sometimes it's nice to actually pour your stain in first because it, um, like you can put your gel into liquid and it will hopefully um, prevent ripping better. Um, so I'm just gonna like pour off the buffer. I can just clean it up. And so now, because this is one of the glass plate ones, so I don't need to like crack it open. I just want to gently peel it open to like find an open spot and then like gently peel it open. It'll want to go to like one side or the other and just like let it. Um, sometimes it'll flow out easier. Just like find a bottom corner, gently peel it off. You can see. Hopefully I don't rip it by trying to show you. But yeah, it's just this really thin thing that's peeling off. Um, and so you can see that there's, well you probably can't see based on the view, but there's like a line that you can see the stain from the, like that's just like the running dye because it didn't go all the way off. 
Um, but the protein's actually up above it, but we can't see it yet because it might be called an instant stain, but it actually takes a couple of minutes at least. So while that goes, then what I do is I like clean up. Um, so since these plates are reusable, I just will wash them off with water. Actually, we reuse the, we reuse basically a lot of the stuff we use to um, run SDS page shelves, which is good because if like I alone have run like 738 or 739 now. Um, so yeah, so we reuse, so we make our own like running buffer and we also reuse um, it, so we just like pour it back in the bottle. Um, so yeah, so we're really lucky that we have great lab techs, um, and so they will like make a ton of it. So we actually keep like um, five times um, running buffer in this um, big thing. Uh, okay, let me just like change my gloves really quick. I'm back and less slimy um, so I can take my phone and actually show you. So we keep this like five times running buffer um, and so then it's 5x so like 200 mils of that and then fill up the bottle to a thousand mils at first. Um, I was like super making it super exact and stuff but it's actually doesn't matter too much so um, but yeah. Um, so I can just like pour it back into the bottle so we have like a funnel that'll help me. Um, so now the protein, so it should be beginning to stain, but it's not. So proteins should like just begin appearing. It's, to make it easier to see, we have like this light box. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to show up on the camera. But so we can put our protein um, out onto the light box. Um, so it, it's easier to see things if you actually put it directly on the light box, but then there's more risk of ripping it. So I can see the ladder, but I can't, and I can start to see my protein bands, but it's going to need a minute. So I'm going to clean that up and then I'll come back to you guys. Okay, so I got pretty sidetracked uh, with some papers and then like tracking down the author of the paper and like emailing this person in Germany. So fingers crossed they get back to me because uh, they had a cool, um, they have some cool methods I was interested in which is just uh, I'm only saying this because it's just because people don't often know that you could like students don't often know like you can actually like email the paper authors and um, hopefully they'll get back to you and answer questions and stuff so I've emailed a few um, before and it's worked out really well um, so don't be scared so for the staining uh, well staining we keep it on this like rocker shaker platform that creaks really loudly especially if you have too much stuff on it. So sometimes we have like a ton of boxes on there. Okay, so now let's turn on the light. Okay, well it got flipped over. So you can see like if it was a, the 0.75 one, it'd be really, really good. Okay, so one of them clearly had like way less protein in it or because I can't even see it, the band. Um, but so the first, this lane is like pre purification and here's at the end. And so you can see that this one has like a bunch of little proteins um, and so it's less pure. So you can see like in this one, you still have a little bit there, like all this little contaminating protein but compared to the main protein, it's a lot less. Um, so in this case, you have the main protein, then you have all these other bands and the proportion of the main protein is less. Um, so if you look at the ladder, so you can see that when we looked at the gel, my um, the protein was like up between the 75 and the 100, which is perfect because my protein's like 97. Um, and so, yeah, so, the more so each band is going to represent like a single protein or like multiple proteins that are like the similar length um and so this the stronger the band like the more there is um but like it's deceptive because for like small proteins you can like the same amount like the same number of copies of that protein so like the same um molarity or whatever it's gonna have like a weaker signal because the how the dye works so it's like this non-specific dye 
that just like kind of globs on to some of the protein um, letters, some of the amino acids. And so it can also differ depending on how many, like the, comp the amino acid composition of the protein. Um, so if it has more or less with the ones that the Comasi likes. Um, and so, yeah. So, but the stronger the band in general, the more pro of that protein there is. And then the more bands there are, the less pure it is. Um, so when you're doing a protein purification, you want to like end up with as few bands as possible and they should be strong. But of course, how strong they are also depend on how much you loaded. Um, but yeah, so right now the gel, it, it, like the background if it is still kind of like bluey. So if I wanted to make the bands like crisper and clearer, I could do is I pour off the um, stain and then I put it in water. And then put it back on the shaker and then the like the background will get clear um, and then it's easier to visualize things and then we could also we have like a gel um, imager thing that we can take pictures um, so we don't have to keep the gels forever although if you keep the gels forever it's kind of cool because they get all shrinky dinky I don't know if you guys know shrinky dinks but yeah so this makes me really happy. So two happy things, bubbles and shrinky dink gels. So hope that helps you um, and have fun running your pages. Um, so they're a lot more fun probably on their first ones than in the 739th. But well, actually in the first ones are probably just too scary. Um, but don't be scared. Um, just make sure you put red to red and black to black, run to red. Um, and yeah, so have fun. <laughs>